Welcome to the Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery, where every death had a life and every life had a story. My name is Jenny Johnson. Hello, and I'm Diane Hartshorn. I love that because we're now doing this on YouTube, in addition to everything else, that we have these pictures behind us. Mm -hmm. It makes me more excited for the topic that we're covering. And it and it's fun, even though you and I have always recorded via Zoom. Mm -hmm. It's fun that I feel like we're actually really now talking <laughs> to people. And I mean, it always was, but it, it's different now. And it's fun. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying how we are doing it this way. Yes. And you know what? Last week seemed pretty successful. We had quite a few viewers on YouTube. So thank you to everybody who thank went you. over to our YouTube channel and checked us out in person. Uh, that was a lot of fun to see the numbers have been ticking, they've been ticking up every day um, for the number of views. So that means we're going to keep doing this for right now. We'll keep video recording as well as doing the audio. So you get both. Uh, and unlike some podcasts, there's plenty of podcasts out there that you can subscribe to, like through a Patreon or any of those to see their videos. We're not going to do that with this. Um, we will make both our video version and our audio version for these episodes completely free to everybody. It just helps us get the stories out there. Well, yeah, that's what, that's why we started to do it. Um, and did you put the Kofi link on? I, I have remember. not put that on there yet. I, um, I still need to do that. I just, I, it's not your end. It's my end. I had to figure out some stuff through our website. Okay. So once I do that, then yes, then we can ask you all to buy us a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Or we whatever it charge, is. Yeah, we won't charge that. That's not, we won't charge for you all to get the content. That's not why we started this podcast. No, I mean, the, the point of this podcast is to share all these really cool stories that we come across. Uh, I had a very fun conversation last week. I went to a little local bookstore in Evergreen and uh, talked with the owner. I was actually looking for a book about Evergreen itself, and there's not very many on the history of the town, but the local bookshops are sometimes the best place to look for those types of oh. books because they usually yeah. carry the books written by the local historians mm -hmm. and authors within the state. Uh, and we had a very fun discussion about visiting cemeteries. And I said, I was telling her that when we went on our cruise last summer, I was impressed that my family tagged along with me to all the cemeteries that we visited in Alaska. And I totally hadn't expected them to, but they did anyway. And now I think we've uh, created a new Taffa file because she said she will add cemeteries to her list of places to visit in the future when she travels somewhere. So oh, that is so cool. Yes, because she's a lover. I mean, she owns a bookshop shop. She's a lover of stories and, and everything. And I said, you know, cemeteries are full of them. If you're willing to take the time to try and dig them up and, and learn about them. And uh, that's what we like to do here. I'm also trying to get back in the habit of writing the Tuesday tidbits, which is our blog. Uh, I just haven't been, I actually did research some, I just didn't get it put together for today, today being Tuesday, when I usually do those, I so hopefully by next week, I'll have it ready to go. Cause I found a really cool story um, oh, about a so family much. and you do so much. So, yeah, but today we are going to visit the circus sort of, as you can tell, if you're watching us on YouTube, we're going to um, join the circus. We're gonna... <laughs> I don't know. What? Even the circus may not want us. <laughs> Is it... Oh, we're going to run away to the circus and we're right going to now... run away and join the circus. Yeah, I don't know. Good. There's been. I was going to say, there's been times when you're raising children, you feel like you're living in the circus already. So oh. I, not now, not now that my kids are older, but when they were little, there were moments. <laughs> no, no, I, I still live with a monkey. So, you know, I'm, it, it never goes away. <laughs> Love it. Evansville Courier and Press, June 23rd, 1918, Hammond, Indiana. Instead of the holiday crowds expected a weeping and bandaged throng of men and women gathered silently about a red and gilt trimmed ticket wagon on the Hammond Circus grounds this afternoon. They were the begrimed survivors of the Hackenbeck Wallace train wreck and were seeking word of the fate of their friends and fellow players who were to give Hammond its first circus of the year today. From behind the bars of the window the ticket of the ticket wagon, Charles Dahmer, manager of the show, 
who escaped from the wreck after throwing his wife from a window, began the task of registering the survivors and attempting to identify the dead. Quietly, the little line of circus men and women filed past the ticket window, giving their names and asking news of friends and relatives. A big crowd had gathered at the grounds to see the circus and remained after hearing of the tragedy to watch the little group of survivors. One clown, about whose head was wrapped in a stained bandage, leaned against a tent pole while he watched the crowd on the edge of the grounds. There'll be no circus in Hammond tonight, he said. The kids will get left this time. Then he fainted. Today's episode of Love is one born out of tragedy. Located in a sunny patch of Chicago's Woodlawn Memorial Park, is a 750-plot section reserved mostly for circus performers. The plot is surrounded by five statues of elephants with lowered trunks, a symbol of mourning and solidarity. The first interments in this plot were victims of the tragic and horrific Hagenbeck Wallace Circus train wreck that took place in Hammond, Indiana on June 22, 1918. At the time of the accident, the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus was the third largest circus touring the United States. The two ahead of it were the Barnum and Bailey Circus and the Ringling Brothers Circus. They were two separate circuses at the time. That year, the families of Hammond, Indiana, and nearby Calumet City, Illinois, were looking forward to a few days of entertainment that this circus had brought to their communities in the past. Sadly, fate intervened, and there was no 1918 circus performance. Following the American Civil War, the circus industry in the United States experienced significant growth and transformation. The post-war period marked the rise of the modern circus, characterized by the inclusion of diverse acts, the use of big top tents, and the expansion of touring shows as the advent of the railroad facilitated the mobility of circus shows, allowing them to reach wider audiences across the country. The first circus in the United States started in Philadelphia in 1793. However, it wasn't until 1825, when they introduced tents, that circuses really began to travel from place to place. P.T. Barnum arrived in 1871 and changed the circus business, while the Ringling Brothers created their own amazing show. Another man who was inspired to create his own circus was Ben E. Wallace. I had no idea the circuses went back to 1793. That's that's interesting. And that's that's in our country. I don't know what it is in Europe because I didn't look. So I know, I mean, circuses have been a thing in Europe as well. I just don't know how far back oh, it I'm, goes yeah. I'm sure because I didn't have still. Yeah, but I didn't do that research. Yeah, that's interesting. Benjamin E. Wallace, son of Ephraim and Rebecca Wallace, was born on October 4, 1847, near Johnstown, Pennsylvania. His family relocated from Pennsylvania to Peru, Indiana, in the early 1860s. In February of 1865, at the age of 18, Ben enlisted in the 13th Indiana Volunteer Infantry Regiment of the Union Army, but his service was short-lived as the Civil War came to an official end on April 9th, 1865. Thank goodness for Ben. Right. Ben returned home to Peru, where he purchased a small livery stable, and in 1891 was running one of the most successful horse trading businesses in the state. The wealth he built from his business allowed Ben to pursue a new pet project, the circus. It's one of those interesting things, if you think about it, since he didn't really see any fighting during his service in the war, he was safe from being injured or killed. Mm -hmm. But had he seen fighting and had he been killed, we wouldn't have the story we're about to tell today. It's very weird when you put it in that context. Mm -hmm. There were dozens of traveling shows and other circuses that had passed through the area and often used Ben's livery stables. He became friendly with many of the owners and performers and began to learn the ropes of running a traveling show. In 1882, Ben and his business partner, James Anderson, purchased several railroad cars of tents, costumes, and more from W.C. Coop, whose traveling circus was in shambles financially. He also acquired additional equipment from a second circus show called Nathan and Company Circus. 
In Chicago, he purchased several more horses, as well as more exotic animals like elephants, camels, and lions. The next year was spent hiring performers, trainers, and other staff to care for the animals and prepare to take the show on the road. Ben Wallace owned several acres of land and other property that he had purchased over the years. He housed much of the equipment and people on a 220-acre farm. Some of the animals were also housed in an old chair factory that was converted into stables. In January of 1884, a fire broke out in the chair factory, resulting in the deaths of several animals, which included lions, tigers, deer, kangaroos, and monkeys. However, this setback didn't stop Wallace and Anderson from pushing on with their new business. They replaced the animals, and on April 26, 1884, the circus held its first performance in Peru, Indiana, under the name, and Jenny actually wrote this in the script. <laughs> take a deep breath here. So I'm going to take a deep breath. The Wallace and Company's Great World Menagerie, Grand International Mardi Gras, Highway Holiday, Hildago, and Alliance of Novelties. <laughs> the- Yay! <laughs> the festivities <laughs> began with a parade in the morning led by a brass band. Both the afternoon matinee and the evening performances sold out, resulting in at least 300 people being turned away on that first night. They and did some re- re- I was going to say, they did some really good advertising ahead of opening night. Uh, One other thing I read had said that at least 5,000 people saw the parade. I don't know how true that was, but um, because neither Hammond nor Calumet City are very big, they're they're like, they butt up against each other. They cross their lines. Calumet City is Illinois. Hammond is Indiana. You cross the street and you're in one or the other, Um, but neither community has ever been super big, but they're not that far from Chicago either. So they could have, like, if they'd advertised it well enough, they could have had people coming down from Chicago. Oh, yeah. People could have taken, if there was a train or whatever you took from Chicago to get anywhere. Um, oh, I bet they left the city to come to the circus. That makes sense. Yes. In 1890, Ben Wallace bought out James Anderson and became the sole proprietor of the show. For the seasons of 1892 to 1894, the circus operated under the name different one, of Cook and Whitby's European Circus Museum and Menagerie. In 1895, it became the B.E. Wallace Circus and was loaded aboard a riverboat and barges and showed along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. At times, it also went by the Great Wallace Show. While there were many traveling shows and circuses that were short-lived because they couldn't support themselves, that was not the case for the Ben Wallace Circus. Not only was Wallace a genius businessman, he also proved to be a talented showman and knew how to draw a crowd. He was determined to make his show something to remember. No flea-bitten animals and sloppy performers for him. He chose performers from many entertainment troops, promising them decent pay, good food, adventure, and excitement. Bandwagon Magazine said of the show, this is no little mud show, it's excellent, has a long list of performers and good equipment. An article about life in the 19th century circus on grunge.com says, at the height of their popularity, circuses employed thousands of people, and not all of them performed in the ring. Circuses with their performers, animals, tents, sets, and costumes had to be set up, broken down, and moved around the country all the time. It took a lot of people to keep the show up and running smoothly. For people who wanted to travel with the show but didn't have any skill as a performer, there were plenty of opportunities. Many of these jobs were manual labor, but the circuses also needed people to care for the animals and cook and serve food for all their employees. I would want to be taking care of all the animals. (laughs) For major shows like Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth, there would be a team of workers who traveled ahead of the circus, put up posters, and promote the various acts that people could see when they came. Yes. So a lot of work goes into putting on a circus. Even today, it's still a lot of work to do a circus. Ben Wallace's circus was so successful that he often collected large amounts of cash and silver while traveling. 
To prevent it from being stolen, the money was shipped back to Peru, Indiana in barrels labeled nails. The banks were unwilling to handle these large amounts, so Ben organized a new bank to handle the transactions, the Wabash Valley Trust, which was later renamed the Wabash Valley Bank, which was located on the corner of Maine and Broadway in Peru. The third floor of the building was used as the costume shop by the performers for the show. Aside from the 1884 fire of the old chair factory, the Wallace Circus suffered very few mishaps until 1903 when it was involved in its first train accident in Shelbyville, Illinois on July 16th. Two people were killed and four others were injured. Less than a month later, the circus was involved in its second train wreck, this one proving to be much more deadly. Richard M. Little wrote in his book, The Great Circus Train Wreck of 1918, on August 7, 1903, the show train was arriving at the local rail yard in Durand, Michigan, after having been conveyed from its departure point at, as two separate train sections. The first train section traveling several minutes ahead of the second section was safely in the Durand rail yard. The second circus train section did not slow down as it approached and entered the yard at its regular traveling speed. It slammed into the rear of the first section, killing 26 men, including the train master, and an unknown number of railroad employees. Several animals were also killed. The engineer of the second section later claimed that his air brakes failed, even though subsequent testing revealed that they were in perfect working order. This would become the second worst circus train wreck ever. The death toll came to 35 with an additional 121 injured. For some circuses, this would have been the end, but in Ben Wallace's world, the show must go on. The surviving members of the circus picked up the pieces, so to speak, and continued on. In 1907, Wallace purchased the Carl Hagenbach Circus and the show was renamed the Hagenbach Wallace Circus. Carl Hagenbach, had been operating animal exhibits since 1877 in the United States and Europe, and the name Carl Hagenbach had become well-known and respected by the time he opened his circus in 1903. Wallace knew that including the Hagenbach name in a show would be another way to draw in the crowds, even though Carl Hagenbach was no longer involved. In fact, Hagenbach attempted to sue Ben Wallace for using his name in 1908. But he lost the suit, and his name and portrait continued to be used for the next 25 years. This new version of the show was billed as the world's highest class circus. Indeed, one newspaper reported that their show belongs to the class of the greatest tent enterprises in the world. You are watching this on YouTube right now. You will see behind me the circus poster that features both um, Wallace and Hagenbach's uh, photos or portraits, I should say. They're not really yeah. photos. These are painted portraits. And um, and for our listeners who aren't watching, there's also pictures of performers and animals and, you know, that traditional looking circus poster. Um, but over my, eh, I got to think about this in terms of, um, it's my so if you're, job. yeah, over one shoulder, the, the gentleman with the beard um, that is Hagenbach, Carl Hagenbach. And on the other side, the gentleman with the mustache, that is Ben Wallace. Mm -hmm. And they continued to use both portraits for a very long time. And apparently Hagenbach was not happy about that because he wasn't getting any money or anything for his name being used. Um, he was paid a very handsome sum for his circus in general. I think he was paid somewhere around $45,000, which at the time, 1903, was a huge yeah. amount of money. But of course, there was no contract that stipulated the rights of the name use and uh, images and all of that. And, and so, um, yeah, unfortunately, he lost his case and for him lost that part of it. Uh, but it was very good news for Ben Wallace to win that particular suit. In March of 1913, another tragedy befell the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. As spring approached the Midwestern United States, especially Nebraska, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, they were hit brutally hard by a series of heavy rainstorms and tornadoes. This caused massive flooding, especially in communities situated along the Ohio River. Newspapers across the country reported on damage to property and loss of life. 
Touring season had not yet begun and the circus was still housed in its winter quarters in Peru, Indiana, which were situated along the banks of the Wabash River. The deluge of rain caused the river to rise and flood so suddenly that employees of the show did not have time to get all of the equipment and animals out of harm's way. The show lost elephants, horses, and much of the show equipment causing serious financial loss. In July 1913, Ben Wallace sold the show to the American Circus Corporation. This corporation was a partnership between Jerry Mugovan, Burt Bowers, and Ed Ballard, and over time they would purchase additional circuses that operated under their original names but were paid for and maintained by the corporation. On June 22, 1918, near Hammond, Indiana, the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus suffered one of the worst tragedies in U.S. circus history. At 3.56 a.m., the Hagenbeck Wallace train stopped to check an overheated wheel bearing on one of the flat cars of the 26-car circus train. An empty troop train pulling 20 Pullman cars was on the same track, moving ahead at full throttle. The train slammed into the circus train. Of the 400 circus personnel aboard the train, 86 died and 127 were injured. A fire spread quickly through the train, burning many of the bodies beyond recognition. There are a lot of newspaper articles that talk about this um, tragedy that were printed in papers all across the, the country. We're, we're going to read snippets from some of them. Some of them are very grotesque in their descriptions of the victims. Uh, I chose not to use any of those particular articles for these purposes, but if you go looking on your own and you choose to go through those articles, I will give you a warning. Some of them are very disturbing to read um, well, about what yeah, happened. The, the news, we, we think the media is graphic today. I mean, I think in the newspapers, I think it was actually even worse back then. Yes, so. there are some definite descriptions of things that had, you know, happened. To, and I get it. The reporters are trying to write about what they're seeing, what they're viewing, right. and they don't have a way to show it to people other than a few photographs. But it's still very hard to read. So if you do go in search of more of these articles on your own, just be prepared. An article printed in the Times out of Munster, Indiana on June 24th, 1918 was headlined, No Doubt Left Now of Blame. It goes on to say, the fault of the accident, which sent 60 souls into eternity, rests solely with the engineer. In a statement this afternoon, attorney McFadden stated that engineer sergeant of the troop train makes no attempt to evade the responsibility and clears everyone else. That a trusted engineer of 16 years excellent service should make such a costly blunder is explained by McFadden by the theory that Sergeant, having an empty train behind him, relaxed and was easy prey to the impulse of sleep. A follow-up article in the same issue goes on to relate all the possible safeguards to prevent railroad wrecks. Five in number were positively ignored by engineer Alonzo Sergeant of the Michigan Central Deadhead Train. He passed the caution signpost, the block system, the flagman who threw his fuse into the cab window, the flares stuck in the ties and the two red lights on the way car of the standing circus, tr circus train, according to the testimony of Klaus, his fireman at the inquest this morning. So yeah, he had five chances to wake up and stop that train before it slammed into the back of the circus train. Interestingly, this could have been worse. The circus train, as in the earlier accident, was split into two sections. So there were 26 or 28 cars, whatever it was. There was another section that had just as many cars that was further ahead um, because it would have been too too much to haul the whole train right. as in one train. So there were a lot of people that survived only because they were on the other train. Over the next several days, lists of dead and injured were printed in papers across the nation. Of course, there were many whose names were not known and many others whose remains were so badly burned and maimed they could not be identified. Some reporters managed to learn about some of those who perished and tried to share their stories, like that of Verna Connor, who performed on the horses. She was labeled Girl of the Golden West. Verna was only 21 and married Connors, who had charge of all the horses in the circus last October. 
he was burned to death and will never be identified. Verna had seven brothers and one sister. Her people had a big ranch in Bliss, Oklahoma, and Verna rode ever since she was four years old. She loved horses, and when Colonel Mil Miller started his Wild West troop, she begged to go along. Her mother finally consented, and she was with Miller until Jess Willard bought the show, and then she left it. She got a fine offer from the Hagenback Wallace people and has been with them ever since. While all the deaths are horrific, perhaps the one that hits the heart the hardest are the deaths of Mrs. Joe Coyle and her two sons, age two and six. Mrs. Coyle was married to Joe Coyle, chief clown. One paper reported, oh, Papa, can't you help me out? This pitiful cry was uttered by little Joe Coyle six years old, as he looked up between the heavy timbers that pinned him beneath the wreckage of the Hagenbach and Wallace circus train into the face of his father, tearing madly with bare hands at burning debris. A moment later, a flame swept between them, forever hiding him from the man of his idol. Beneath the boy was Mrs. Coyle and another child, Joe Coyle Sr., one of the best known clowns with the circus was torn from the place by his friends, else he would perish. Incredibly, Joe Coyle Sr. would continue his career as a circus clown well into the 1950s. That was hard to read. It Bad. was very hard to read. Yeah, he tried so hard to rescue his family and just couldn't. And the, the fire was spreading so fast that um, he was pulled away before he could pull the kids out. So his younger son, whose name I never found in any of the stuff that I was looking at, um, was only two or two and a half years old. So very little when he died. And of course, at six years old, too. Oh, yeah. Some of those who died had family who traveled to the site to claim their remains and take them home for burial. However, 56 victims remained. It was decided to bury them in individual caskets, but in one mass grave at Woodlawn Cemetery in Chicago, where a plot had just been purchased by the Showman's League, a fraternal order created in 1913 to support men and women in show business. Only five victims have marked graves. Five days after the crash, the survivors and more than 1,500 other mourners gathered at Woodlawn for the burial, burial of their fellows. As for the survivors, they decided the show must go on, and despite the tremendous physical and psychological toll of the accident, the Hackenbeck Wallace Circus only missed two performances of their scheduled performances that year. Thanks to other circuses providing equipment and additional crew. The victims of this tragedy have never been forgotten. Each Memorial Day, members of the Showman's League of America gather at the grave to place flags and show their love for the performers and workmen who came before them. According to Woodlawn's website, Showman's Rest is one of the most visited sites in the cemetery, and many circus performers still choose to be buried alongside their circus brothers and sisters. I mean, that was very sad, definitely very sad. But Oh, very. Very interesting, too, with the history of the circuses. That was... It's fascinating. Yes. And there was, this was one of those episodes that I had a harder time putting the script together for because there's actually a lot of information out there. Like sometimes I don't have enough information and that makes it tricky in another way. This time there was so much that I kind of had to sift through and break it down so it would be enough for this episode and for the story we want to tell. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, there's a lot of articles online. There's um, one of the and actually this was what led me to do the choose this as our topic is there's this book that came out oh no it's not going to show up there's a book that came out um a couple years ago called the great circus train wreck of 1918 actually we mentioned it earlier mm -hmm. uh this was sent to me by dave's aunt trudy uh oh. i think we had had a whole conversation about this when we had visited together and then she sent me this book she actually lives in hammond so you know she's local very dave's familiar. Yeah, my husband's family, both his parents are from Hammond and or Calumet City, depending on which side of the tracks you're on. Uh, but so his he's got lots of family out there. And that was something that had interested her. She sent me the book quite some time ago, and I just hadn't had a chance to really get back to it. But uh, so thank you, Aunt Trudy, for the suggestion for this yeah, episode. That's so sweet. 
and I just decided, you know, this is our month of love. February is our month of love. And um, even though this is a very tragic and sad story, there's still so much love. I mean, these particular circus people, and I mean, the death toll was both performers and workers, were so beloved by each other as a circus family, but also right. by the communities. Um, they, it was something that, you know, the towns looked forward to every year was the circuses coming through and the circuses, there were a lot of different ones, as we said, and they would make sure they alternated their routes every year so that you didn't have the same circus coming back to the same town year after year. So they would like sort of work together and plan in a way. Yes. They Which oh, that is so neat. Was great for audiences because they would get to see something different each year. But it was also beneficial to the circuses because they could make more money that way by making sure that they had new and different things for people to see when they would go to the circus. Um, and I think, cool. you know, I, I mean, I don't know a ton about the circus. I don't even know if I've ever been to a circus. Probably not. Mostly because, like I said earlier, I don't like clowns and there's clowns in every circus. But Love yeah. I get very uncomfortable looking at clowns, <laughs> but um, the things I have read and I do know about circus is these, the, the performers, the people who work the circus, they really do become a family. Part of it's probably because they travel together all the time. These are, and even there's modern day circuses that still do this. There's a, a travel season and, you know, they come with, and now they come with other things. A lot of times they come with carnivals that include rides and all of that kind of stuff. Right. But, um, and then of course you've got um, like Cirque du Soleil and all of that in Vegas, which is more of a permanent installation there, but that's still a performance based thing where you have very talented performers doing amazing um, performances and tricks and things. And, um, but yeah, this, this story, it was just so sad. <laughs> no, it was, it's very sad. I remember seeing when I was young and when we lived in Denver, we went to go see Barnum and Bailey's circus and the three ring circus. And, you know, they had three different acts and you had to, you know, watch all of them, but it was, yeah, it was phenomenal. It really was a phenomenal show. And I, I can't imagine what it would have been like back then. Right. As there wasn't TV, there wasn't all the stuff that even I had as a kid, which I can't imagine then what we have now, but to have that entertainment come and the, just the exoticness of the animals and the performance must performers must have just been so amazing. I can imagine how heartbreaking and horrific it was, of course, for the, the circus people, but also the, the public to, you know, wit witness this and, and be there. And yeah, it was probably very devastating. Yes. And while we're discussing it, I do have a few other images to share. So for those that are on uh, YouTube with us, I have a couple other images uh, besides my poster here. Uh, the, the picture behind Diane is actually part of the memorial at Showman's Rest in Woodlawn. Um, and you can see one of the five elephants behind her. Yeah. Uh, the, the other pictures are just, I don't know which ones Jenny is putting up, but it is a beautiful area of the cemetery. Oh my goodness. It's just, it's gorgeous. This one, not a cemetery. Well, it is of the cemetery. This is what it looks like when they had the burial. So you can oh, see, wow. I'll cover myself up here. You can see the caskets all lined up in the one wow. grave and you can see all the people gathered around the outside of the grave. And that crowd goes back quite a distance. I mean, you're only getting a small portion of it in that picture. Well, imagine just digging that grave. Yes. I mean, I'm sure they had, well, I don't know. It was 1918. I they may have had equipment. Yeah. Some equipment, but still it, as big a grave wow. as it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, so that was an interesting photo. And then uh, I had, I think one other, and just to dis dispel any rumors, there are rumors that some of the elephants are buried at Woodlawn. They are not. None of the animals. I mean, there were animals also killed in addition to the humans. 
uh, none of the animals were buried at the cemetery. Uh, but I guess those rumors have been around for a while. Oh, that makes sense. And I don't know if it's because there's elephant monuments. And so they just assume somebody who maybe doesn't know the history of it has decided that there's elephants buried there. I don't know, but there are no elephants or any of the animals that died in the train wreck um, are not buried at Woodlawn. It's only the humans that got buried there. Okay, so the next photo I have um, is a photo of the accident itself that was printed in the papers. So you can wow. see the train is actually on fire there. You can see the crowd you know, standing on these other tracks, kind of watching it. And then if you look close enough, you can see people trying to pull uh, survivors and victims out of the wreck. Uh, um, it's horrific. It's just, yeah, it's hard to see that, but that's what it looked like. And there were plumes of smoke and it was just, it was hard. It was a hard, hard thing, but there's some other, and there's other photos um, also available online. So again, if you want to know more, definitely go online and, and look for some of the other articles and photos that are available out there. But do be warned that some of them are very graphic in nature when you read them, because uh, the reporters were definitely, Thank I think you. in some cases, trying to sensationalize it a little bit. Oh, yeah. In other cases, and it depends on whose style of writing you're reading, which newspaper you're reading. Um, in other cases, they really were just trying to describe to the readers yeah. what was happening uh, that like, day. Like painting a picture. I mean, it's, that's, that's, that was their job, but yeah, I agree. Probably a little bit of both sensationalism and reporting this, the tragedy. Yeah. Okay, so we thank you for taking time to join us for this ordinary, extraordinary story. To learn more about the story we shared, please visit our website, theordinaryextraordinarycemetery.com, where you can find the resources we use to research this episode. And if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel, The Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery Podcast. And if you like us, give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment because that helps put up the... Um, it puts us up higher in the feed of YouTube and maybe more people who haven't found us yet will be able to find us and learn more about all the cemeteries that we will be adding now to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us on social media where we share all of our cemetery photos, quotes, tidbits, and more. Uh, we are on Facebook and Instagram at Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery and on X at Ord Extra Sim. If you enjoyed this or any of our episodes, please consider leaving a five-star review and comments on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our website, or as Diane said, YouTube. Your positive reviews and enthusiasm for our show help others who love cemeteries and history to discover us and our ordinary, extraordinary stories. Until we meet again.